the disease that most people most often associate with smoking is cancer and lung cancer in particular. It's interesting because cancer is not what kills most smokers from their smoking. More people die from heart disease from smoking than die from cancer. But cancer is a disease that most often will be thought about when people think about the risks they face from smoking. The next few slides will explain why this is the case. Unlike heart disease, which always existed and was always a cause of excess death in the population, lung cancer was once a rare disease. This is the front page of a medical journal. The only thing important about this page is the year it was printed. It's on the bottom was 1866. This book is over 140 years old. Here is what this book said about lung cancer, again, 140 years ago. Carcinoma Affecting the lung is an extremely rare disease and is generally developed secondarily, that is, subsequently to carcinoma in other situations. All that translates to mean is, 140 years ago, lung cancer was almost an unheard of disease. If a doctor came across a lung cancer, he would have had it written up in a medical journal. He'd call all his doctor friends together and they'd all look in the microscope in total amazement and think, Wow, that's rare. We've never seen one of those before. And they would probably be working with the assumption they would probably never see one again. This is how uncommon a disease this was. But lung cancer was not destined to stay this rare disease. Here is a chart showing a trend in death rate of cancers in general for men between the years 1930 and 1995. If you look, even back in 1930, lung cancer was still a rare disease. But all of a sudden, something happened, and lung cancer started to shoot up. And if you look in this chart, you'll see that by the mid-1960s, lung cancer passed up every other type of cancer to become the leading cause of death in men, and skyrocketed after that. It wasn't until a few years back where there was finally a decline in lung cancer rates in men. Here is a chart for women's cancer rates in the same time period. What's interesting to note is lung cancer was not going up at any rate compared to what was going on in men. A lot of women continued smoking with the attitude that smoking wasn't a risk factor for them. The medical and scientific community thought that. The reason for this belief was they saw men, when they were smoking, were having very high rates of lung cancer. They were skyrocketing. Women who were smoking during this same time frame were not getting lung cancer anywhere close to the rate that men were. So they thought there was something protective about being a woman that men didn't have, that women were not at risk of lung cancer in the same way that men were, even when they identified smoking as a risk factor for lung cancer. Here are the two charts side by side. Again, you could see men's rates for lung cancer skyrocketed in a time period where women didn't. And there was that belief that there was something protective about being a woman. The difference was never based on sexes. The difference was not based on anything physical nor anything biological. The difference was based on history. Men didn't start smoking in 1930. Men started smoking commonly at the turn of the century. Cigarettes were not even mass-produced until the turn of the century. But before then, only men basically were hand-rolling cigarettes. But even once mass production came out, women it, were still not smoking much in society. It was still basically an antisocial behavior for women to be smoking when it was totally acceptable for men. Men basically smoked for 30 years that m women didn't. The first 30 years, nothing much really happened, and this is the case with lung cancer. Lung cancer doesn't normally happen the year after you start smoking. It t takes decades for the risks to start to increase, but the longer men were smoking, they had more pack years under their belt, and then their smoking rates started to climb. Women did not start smoking commonly until 1930. So during the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, not much seemed to be happening. Again, it was what was happening in men back in the 1910, uh, 1920, 1930. Lung cancer didn't start going up. But 30 years after men started smoking, it skyrocketed. And then a similar thing happened in women after they started smoking. Many people don't want to blame the increase in lung cancer on cigarette smoking. There's plenty of people who like to blame it on things like air pollution. I'll get people coming in clinics all the time who've heard that living in Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, oh, it's like smoking 20 packs of cigarettes a day. So what's another pack or two going to do to them? 
In reality, though, the effects of pollution are nothing compared to the effects of smoking on the lung. The next series of slides will show how much smoke comes in from cigarette smoking in contrast to what can come in from pollution and other kind of industrial exposures. Here we see an example of a non-smoker's city dweller's lung. The black carbon deposits on top and speckled throughout the lungs are the kind of effects you can see from pollution. When compared to a smoker's lung, you can see there's very little comparison. The white area is lung cancer. That's what killed this patient. But the black area, every smoker's lung looks like to a strong degree. Most smokers look at this and think, oh, there's no way that happens in their lungs. They take in smoke and they blow it out. They think that's all that happens. In reality, when a person takes a drag on a cigarette, nine-tenths of the smoke that comes in stays in the lung. Only about 10% is actually exhaled. This is showing the buildup of tar and what it looks like inside of the lung. Another way to illustrate how much smoke comes in is to the use of smoking machines. This machine is designed to smoke like a cigarette smoker. It loads itself, it lights itself, it takes five puffs, it knocks off its own ashes, it takes five more puffs, it spits out the cigarette, it loads itself, lights itself, and starts the cycle all over again. In one day, this machine will smoke 2,000 cigarettes. This is the amount of tar that is collected in that machine in one day. That's the same amount a person who smokes one pack a day will put in their lungs in just over a three-month period, meaning a person who smokes one pack a day will put four times the amount of that tar in their lung every year. A two-pack-a-day smoker is putting eight times the amount of that tar in their lung every year. That's why the lungs are turning so discolored. The real issue, though, is not that the lungs are turning colors. The issue is, what are these chemicals that are turning the lung colors? Tar is made up of over 4,000 individual chemicals. Many of these chemicals are poisonous, many of them are known to destroy lung tissue, and many of them are known to cause cancer. The term given to a chemical known to cause cancer is a carcinogen. At this time, there are 81 known carcinogens found in tobacco smoke. The way many chemicals are first identified as carcinogens is from animal experimentation. We know if we take the tar from cigarette smoke, dilute it, paint it up on the skin of mice, that over 60% of the mice will develop cancer of the skin. Tobacco tar can then be broken down to individual components, and then these individual chemicals can be experimented on. One of these chemicals from tobacco smoke is called benzopyrene, and it's one of the most powerful carcinogens known to man. If benzopyrene is put into a paraffin tablet and then implanted in the cheek of hamsters, 90% of those hamsters will go on to develop cancer of the cheek. You'll hear about products on the market like saccharin, cyclamates, red dyes. For decades, these chemicals have been getting banned from human consumption. They will do experiments, sometimes just in one country, and it will cause cancer in 5% of lab animals, or 2% of animals, and sometimes 1%. And these chemicals will get banned. And people have always assumed that if they banned all these other chemicals, and they never banned smoking, that the cigarette experiments probably weren't as conclusive, that cigarettes could not have been as dangerous as chemicals that were banned from the marketplace. Common sense would have dictated that thought. Common sense would be wrong, because while some of these chemicals were banned for causing cancer again in as low as 2% of lab animals, this chemical was causing cancer in 9 out of 10 of the animals, 90%. Worse than that, most chemicals that have been banned from human consumption, we don't know if they've ever caused a single case of human cancer. Well, we know if we gave animals huge dosages of certain chemicals, that a small percent of animals would get cancer. We saw people using these substances for decades, and we never saw increase of cancer in the population using these chemicals. With cigarette smoking, we're dealing with a different dynamic, though. We're talking about cancers that were shooting up in epidemic proportions portion in the human population repeating the experiment. So what do I mean by the human population who repeat this experiment? That's people who smoke cigarettes, cigars, and pipes. They do exactly to themselves what experimenters are doing on these animals. They take these tires, they concentrate them on their mouth, on their lip, on their tongue. They mix them with their saliva, they swallow them. A high percentage is going right into the lung and sticking into the respiratory tract. All these sites have increased rates of cancer due from this exposure. 
The rest of this video is going to focus on how smoking causes lung cancer, but there's other cancers that are also associated with smoking. Here is a list of some of those cancers, some of them being extremely dangerous, even having a higher death rate than lung cancer, as in the case of pancreatic and esophageal cancer. What makes lung cancer much more noteworthy, though, is the frequency at which this disease strikes. It is the number one killer of both men and women of cancer. The next series of slides will show the destruction that goes on in the windpipe, the trachea, and the bronchus. This is crucial tissue involving cigarette smoking. It is where a vast majority of lung cancers that occur actually do happen. And these slides will explain the damage that cigarettes specifically do in this area and why it increases the cancer risk. Here we see a cross-section illustration of a human lung. The windpipe is the tube coming down into the lung. And in this illustration, there's a square showing a blow up of the opening right at the bronchus. And then in the circle, it's showing a microscopic blow up of that specific tissue. This tissue is extremely important when it comes to discussing the dangers of cigarette smoking. Here we see an enlargement of the epithelial tissue of the bronchus. On top, we have little hair-like projections called cilia. Cilia, again, they're little projections that beat back and forth constantly, close to 600 beats per minute. Then there's these white cells here, labeled J. These are called goblet cells. These cells secrete mucus whenever irritated. So if you inhale uh, dust or particulate matter of any kind, the goblet cells secrete mucus. The cilia is sweeping back and forth and basically sweeping the mucus out of the lung. This way, we're able to trap a lot of incoming irritants and sweep them clear from the lung tissue. The lung cells labeled I are columnar cells. These are the cells that actually carry the cilia. Then underneath are two layers of basal cells. They are labeled L in this illustration here. The basal cells are like a skin. They're a basement membrane, and normally there's usually two layers. This is how the tissue will normally appear in a healthy non-smoker. Here we see actual human bronchial epithelial tissue at a microscopic blow-up level. The pink fuzz on top are the cilia, the white cells secrete the mucus, the goblet cells, and again the two layers of basal cells. The cilia cleansing action works for just about everybody. Everybody, that is except cigarette smokers. The day a person takes their first puff on a cigarette, they start having dramatic effects on these tissues. When a person takes their first puff, they slow down their cilia. After that, if they continue to smoke, they'll eventually paralyze them altogether. Now the goblet cells are still getting irritated from the tobacco smoke and the chemicals coming in which are primary irritants. Without the cilia working, they can't sweep this mucus out, at which point it starts to build up in the windpipe. This is where the smokers start getting their first smoker's cough or having to clear their throat on a regular basis. Since the cilia can no longer sweep out the excess mucus, it builds up and coughing becomes a necessary action to try to sweep the lung clean. Besides the chemicals that paralyze and destroy cilia, another action that happens is the chronic irritation to the basal cells. Originally, there were two normal layers of basal cells, but as you start irritating the tissue over an extended time period, more and more layers start to form. Here we see four layers of basal cells where there used to be two. It's very similar to when you work with your hands a lot and you start building up calluses on your skin. Your skin starts to form extra layers trying to protect your hand. Your lung, in a sense, tries the same action, tries to form extra layers to protect itself. Eventually, though, the cilia toxic agents will totally destroy the cilia. Now what happens is the basal cells not only form extra layers, but the cells start to transform. They get turned into something often called squamous cells. These cells are precancerous. A doctor may know they're down there, but there is nothing that doctor can do to prevent this from turning into cancer, except give the patient one solid piece of advice. Stop smoking. If the person quits smoking, the squamous cells will eventually be sloughed off. The cilia will start to regenerate. If a person quits smoking for three days, cilia will start to regenerate. In about six months, they will get all the cilia back they ever had in their life. If they were to smoke one cigarette a day, which again, most smokers cannot, but if they somehow could pull off that stunt, they still would not be able to regenerate the cilia. There's enough irritation from that cigarette to stop the full healing process from going on. 
With the cilia destroyed, smokers are more prone to infection. They don't have their first line of defense working anymore that non-smokers normally would have, the sweeping action of the cilia taking out the mucus from the lung. Now the squamous cells are still getting irritated by constant cigarette smoking exposure. All that needs to occur now is one of these cells to turn malignant, and then this person has lung cancer. The cancerous cells are not going to stay in the lining tissue of the windpipe for long. They're going to start to invade underlying lung tissue. Every drop of blood, before it goes anywhere in the body, it has to go to the lung to get oxygen. You have a tremendous amount of circulatory lymphatic system set in the lung for this transport system. All that needs to have happen is one of these cells breaks off, gets into the circulatory lymphatic system, it will start to spread throughout the body before there is much that can be done about it. Here we can see an actual microscopic blow up of the epithelial tissue of the lung starting to invade into underlying lung tissue. Again, all that needs to occur is for one of these cells to break off and this cancer will spread and there will not be much that can be done about it once it gets to this point. This is how much of the lung is sometimes taken in by cancer before a person even knows they have it. The first sign of lung cancer is coughing. Smokers are always coughing. If they wait for the secondary symptom, which is spitting up small amounts of blood, at that point it is almost always too late to save the patient. The problem with lung cancer is it's very difficult to detect in early stages. As mentioned earlier, the problem with lung cancer is twofold. One is it strikes so many people, again being the number one cause of cancer death in both men and women. But the frequency of occurrence is only part of the problem. The other part is the fact that it's a very difficult to treat cancer. All stages of lung cancer have a 14% survival rate. What this means is for every 100 people who walk into a doctor's office who are told they have lung cancer, 86 of those 100 will be dead within 5 years. Most of them will be dead within 6 months of diagnosis. The trick with any cancer is to catch them as early as possible. The earlier cancer is detected, the earlier treatment can be started, and the more successful treatment will generally be. With lung cancer, if it's caught localized, we could save up to 49%. The problem is, it is very difficult to catch lung cancer in an early state. And even if we do, a 49% success rate for early diagnosed cancers is a terrible success rate. Most common forms of cancer, if caught localized, we will save a majority of the people with them. Breast cancer, the number two cause of death of women, if caught localized, we can save over 90% of women caught. Most common forms of cancer, if caught localized, will save a vast majority. But lung cancer, even when caught early, has a low survival rate, again, under 50%. Only 15% of lung cancers are caught in a localized state. This all translates to the fact that most people who develop lung cancer will end up dying from it. The real only good news about lung cancer is the vast majority of them are totally preventable. Most lung cancers that occurred today are caused by cigarette smoking, and if people would just stop smoking, they would begin to reduce their risks. Most cancers, we do not know the cause. We do not know what people can do to prevent them. This one cancer, we do know. It, smoking is the primary cause and the primary risk factor that people will ever face. To minimize your risk of ever developing lung cancer or any of the other crippling or deadly diseases that smoking can cause is still just a matter of making and sticking to a personal commitment to never take another puff.